The kinetic energy of rotation. If we think of our familiar equation for kinetic energy as being one-half mv squared, if we apply that to an object that is in pure rotation, such as the blade of a table saw, for example, if we just apply one-half mv squared to that, we will get the kinetic energy of the table saw's center of mass, which is zero because it has no translational motion at all. The center of mass of the object is sitting still. But every particle that makes up the saw blade is moving with translational motion, although it is in a circle. We can think of it as tangent to the circle, and so we can apply our familiar equation of one-half mv squared to every particle that makes up the saw blade. So the total kinetic energy of the saw blade, then, is one-half mv squared, of every piece of the blade, where one, two, three, dot, 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 represents all the pieces of the saw blade. And for a rotating object, we know that the tangential velocity of that object is r times omega, the, the radius of the circle that it's moving in times the angular velocity that it's spinning at. So if I take my total kinetic energy of my rotating object, which is the sum of all the kinetic energies of the pieces that make up the rotating object, I'm going to replace in each term the velocity with r omega. So I have now that my kinetic energy is the sum of the one-half mv squareds of all the pieces, where each piece is labeled with the subscript i, and i goes from 1 to n, with n being the number of pieces that make up my rotating object. I'm going to rearrange it a little bit, and what's inside the parentheses here is a representation of the distribution of the mass of my object. So it depends not only on just what is the mass, but how far is the mass located from the axis of rotation. And this term right here, mi ri squared, I'm going to define that as the rotational inertia, or the moment of inertia, of the object. And the sum of all those terms will be called the moment of inertia, and I will label it with the capital letter I, standing for inertia. So you notice that the moment of inertia not only depends upon how much mass is there, but where the mass is located. How far is it away from the axis of rotation? So first we'll look at a single object and we'll change where its axis of rotation is. In the first example, the axis of rotation will run all the way along the length of the rod and it will rotate about that axis like this. So I can feel with my hands that it's very easy to rotate this object in this orientation. But if I change the axis of rotation to be here now, now the object rotates like this about this axis, I can feel with my hand that it's more difficult to rotate this. Because, like in my equation, it says, even though the mass of the rod hasn't changed, where the mass is located relative to the axis of rotation. Here, we've got mass here and mass here that's this far away from the axis. So it has more inertia, more resistance to change in velocity. And I notice that it's more difficult to spin it this way, whereas this way, spinning it, all the mass is very close to the axis of rotation, so that's very easy to spin. Let's look at, an, at another example. Here I've got uh, the same type of metal rod, now with 500 gram weights on either side, and I've set it up uh, two different ways. Both of these obviously have the same mass. They're both made of one rod and two 500 gram weights, but here I'm going to hold it here and rotate it like this, so this is my axis of rotation right here. And when I do the same thing with this one, this is very easy to rotate. That one's a bit more difficult because the mass is further away from my axis of rotation. Easy, difficult, same mass, different moments of inertia. So if I is the sum of all these mr squared terms, if I replace that in the equation with the letter I, I come up with the familiar form of our equation for rotational motion. The kinetic energy of, a ro of an object in pure rotation is one-half I omega squared. And you'll notice that does look very similar to one-half mv squared. 
And we're going to find that when we make the switch from a linear equation to a rotational equation, wherever we see the letter M for mass in the linear equation, we'll be able to replace it with the letter I in the rotational equation. And the same goes for V velocity. In the rotational equation, we'll be able to replace it with omega. So here's an example. My linear or translational kinetic energy is one half mv squared. My equivalent rotational kinetic energy equation is one half i omega squared. M was replaced by i and v was replaced by omega. Let's compare the moments of inertia for these three objects. Rotating about our axis of rotation labeled with red, this red line. Our first particle is 36 kilograms at a distance from the axis of rotation of one meter. Our second particle is nine kilograms at a distance of two meters from the axis of rotation. And our third particle is four kilograms located three meters from the axis of rotation. So if we're gonna find the moment of inertia for a single particle, it's just mr squared. But if I wanted to know what's the a moment of inertia of all three of these things together as one object spinning around my axis of rotation, then I do the sum of each of their moments of inertia. So let's do those calculations. And we see that each object by itself has the same moment of inertia, 36 kilogram meters squared, m times r squared. So each particle has a moment of inertia of 36, all three as a collection of particles would have a moment of inertia of the sum of that 36 plus 36 plus 36 or 108 kilogram meters squared. If a rigid body consists of a few particles, then we can calculate its rotational inertia about a given rotation axis with this equation. That is, we can find the product mr squared for each particle and then sum the products. If a rigid body consists of a great many adjacent particles, we say it is continuous, like a Frisbee, for example. And using this equation would have so many terms, it would require the use of a computer. Thus, instead, we replace this sum with the integral and define the rotational inertia of the body as I equals the integral of R squared dm, where dm is the incremental mass of each small piece that is a distance R away from the axis of rotation. Included in the class notes, I will show you some examples of how to apply this and calculate some actual moments of inertia for some common objects. But we're gonna skip that here and we're just gonna tell you to go ahead and use table 10-2 to look up moments of inertia for common objects through common axes of rotation. Here is table 10-2. It is on page 253 in your textbook. Table 10-2 only gives nine examples of moments of inertia through common objects and common axes of rotation. But by applying what's known as the parallel axis theorem, we can extend this to many more objects. For example, here is one from table 10-2, a solid cylinder or disc about a central axis, and we see from the table that its moment of inertia is 1 half mr squared. We can find the moment of inertia for many objects using the parallel axis theorem. As long as we have our new axis parallel to the axis that goes through the center of mass, we can easily find the new moment of inertia about the new axis by applying the parallel axis theorem, which says the new moment of inertia will be the moment of inertia through the center of mass from table 10-2 plus the term mh squared, where h is the distance between the center of mass axis and the newly drawn axis. So for this drawing, where I've located the new axis, stuck right to the edge of the cylinder, that h distance is going to be the same as the radius of the cylinder. So I see here, 
here's my ICOM, one half MR squared, that I got from table 10-2. And H is R of the circle. And so the new moment of inertia of my cylinder with the axis along the edge of the cylinder will be three halves MR squared.